take you on a quick tour of the more than half dozen wildfires burning across our crispy, dry state today. In Park County, mandatory evacuations due to the Weston Pass fire, nine miles southwest of Fair Play. 250 acres have burned. People living between the fire and County Road 22 are being told to leave home. The current monster fire burning is the Spring Fire in Castilla and Huerfano counties. Nearly 24,000 acres have gone up. Buildings have burned right along with the street signs and the address numbers that would identify them. The focus is on mandatory evacuations, which continue to expand. The Golf Course Fire near Grand Lake, that had our full attention right about this time last night. It appears to be on the verge of control. There's 60% containment. Some evacuees have gone home. More still waiting to return as County Roads 48 and 49 in Grand County are still closed. The Sugarloaf Fire looks a lot scarier than it is. It's burning through Beetle Kill, which, I mean, that's a healthy process for the forest in Grand County up north of Loveland Pass. The Sugarloaf Fire is in a remote area. It is not near homes, though there is a portion of the Williams Fork Valley that's closed due to the smoke. 184 acres have burned there. Going to take you through a couple more. There's the High Chateau Fire in Teller County. 106 acres, no containment, a few neighborhoods evacuated there. The Stonemore Fire in Pueblo County. 137 acres, no containment, some evacuations as well. And you remember the 416 Fire in Durango. That's the old one which continues to simmer and spit in southwest Colorado. 41,000 acres have burned in total, though they have 37% containment on the key line of that fire. We are keeping track of all of these on 9news.com. You can click through all of the active fires and look for details on evacuations and containment. One of the most frequently asked questions we get right after, why haven't pot taxes fixed all of Colorado's problems? Is why is that 747 super tanker in the springs not flying to flush out all of Colorado's wildfires? Marshall Zellinger sets out to verify whether these fires are getting the resources they need. The super tanker in Colorado Springs is literally the elephant in the room. The largest firefighting tool in Colorado is not being used on Colorado fires because it's not under contract to do so, except in Colorado Springs and El Paso and Douglas counties. Even if it was allowed in other parts of Colorado, it wouldn't necessarily be utilized. There's times where using a large air tanker just isn't going to be effective. Brian Oxiger is the state fire management officer with the Bureau of Land Management. We talked with him to verify what can be used in a wildfire, when it would be used, and when it really wouldn't do any good. Engines are almost always the first resource. And in remote areas, those helicopters are going to be uh, the fastest way to get to the fire versus our engines, which may travel times a little longer. Helicopters drop water directly on flames. A single engine air tanker does not. It drops retardant to build a perimeter around flames. We have, I think, eight of them staged in Colorado right now for initial attack across the state. Larger air tankers can drop more retardant, but if you don't see them in the sky, it does not mean the best resources are not being used. You can put retardant down and the fire is going to burn right past it like a crown fire. So when a fire moves up into the crowns of the trees, it's less likely that that fire retardant is going to be effective. Which resources are used ultimately comes down to three things. Fire behavior, which way is it burning? Values at risk, what's in its path? and weather conditions. Wind and stormy weather near the fire or the airport will ground the aircrafts. There's no homes, no infrastructure, not a lot of values out there, then we're not going to typically put firefighters at risk. For next, I'm Marshall Zellinger. So back to the super tanker. The Forest Service is accepting proposals right now for air tanker contracts through the middle of July. But since the government's going to government, you know, the decision isn't actually going to be made until after the peak of fire season. In case you missed the news online today, Dylan Redwine's father pleaded not guilty this morning down in southwest Colorado. Mark Redwine has long denied having anything to do with his son's disappearance from his house in Vicito back in 2012. Dylan's remains were found nearby years later. His father's going to go on trial in November. If Colorado Democrats were aiming for a show of unity for Jared Polis' campaign for governor, then at least one of his primary rivals probably should have showed up to today's unity rally. Instead... We get fence sitter extraordinary John Heckenlooper, the governor, finally offering his endorsement of Polis and promising that all their past clashes are behind them. Heckenlooper, of course, is quite friendly to oil and gas. Polis wants to convert the entire electric grid to renewables eventually. And Polis is also campaigning on the idea of Medicare for all universal health coverage. Heckenlooper tried to explain to reporters today why Polis is not much more of a liberal guy than he is. 
I think Jared Polis is going to come across, and you watch. I think he's going to run as a moderate. I think he's going to govern as a moderate. Uh, I'm happy to sit down two years from now. You guys can call, you know, we'll sit down. In the midst uh, of I'll, Iowa? I'll, in Iowa or I'll, New Hampshire? I'll, <laughs> I'll buy the lunch. We will look at, at whether Jared Polis is, go, is governing as a moderate. And you are going to campaign heavily for him? Yes, yes I am. Heard that Iowa, New Hampshire reference. That was our politics guy, Brandon Ritterman, jousting with a Colorado politician for the last time. This is Brandon Ritterman's last day at Nine News. He is moving on to Sacramento to join our sister station there. Brandon's reporting has been a key part of Next since our first day on the air. He has made a lot of politicians squirm in his seven years here, but Brandon is respected because he's fair. His bias has always been for the truth. Brandon has never tried to cozy up to Colorado's political power players for their friendship or status or to get a job someday. Brandon's work reflected the fact that he saw his obligation as one that was to you, to get you the truth, to hold politicians to their promises to you. Brandon did that with a smile and with a passion that we're going to miss around here as we carry on his unrelenting bias for the truth. The scooters are coming. The scooters are coming. Denver Public Works, its hand forced by the sudden invasion of dockless bikes and scooters, has come out with a plan to make them street legal. Well, actually not street legal, sidewalk legal. You cannot ride them in the streets, in bike lanes, in parks, on trails, or at the 16th Street Mall. The city's plan, released today, incentivizes these e-bike and e-scooter companies to place their thingies out in neighborhoods where the city feels like they're going to be needed and to rebalance their locations daily, to take them back out to the neighborhoods as people bring them into the city center. And it looks like the city figures that these scooters are going to end up in Wash Park and the Highlands and Stapleton anyway without their help. So the city's map there, you see the blue and pink areas highlighted? They're trying to get the companies to put them in lower income and more far-flung neighborhoods as well. Hoarding. It is so often a source of shame for people in their families that we don't discuss it a lot. Our Nine Wants to Know team's investigation into a hoarder who was found dead in his home in Denver a year after he disappeared, it now has us looking at that issue in depth and finding that it's more common than many think. Here's investigative reporter Chris Vanderveen. Stuff. Everyone has it, collects it in one way or another, but clearly some collect more stuff than others. And some of those collect so much stuff, their collection becomes downright debilitating. Hoarding disorder, according to the American Psychiatric Association, impacts as many as 6% of all Americans. In a country of 325 million, that means as many as 19.5 million hoarders. That's more than the number of bipolar and autistic Americans combined. In 2013, for the first time, the so-called Bible of Psychiatry, a.k.a. the DSM-5, recognized compulsive hoarding as its own mental disorder. And there's a belief it might be, for some, a matter of genetics. Remember biology class? Yeah, neither do I. But if you did, you might recall this. Each one of our cells contains 23 pairs of chromosomes. This study suggested a region on chromosome 14 is linked with compulsive hoarding behavior. The average age of first symptoms, 13. Yet the average age of someone seeking treatment for it, 50. Most hoarders are men and many tend to live alone, having alienated even close relatives with all of that stuff. Hoarders tend to target free stuff, trivial things like neighborhood flyers or restaurant sugar packets. All feel a sense of intense dread when faced with the possibility of losing any of their stuff. Think of it this way. Picture a precious heirloom or family photo of yours. Now imagine watching someone light it on fire. Hoarders feel that connection with everything. If left untreated, it tends to get worse as more and more stuff accumulates. There's even a scale to rate hoarding. A level one looks like this. Nope, no clutter. Then there's level two, level three, level four. This is where experts tend to say compulsive hoarding begins. Level five, six, seven, eight, and then there's nine. A ceiling touching, room filling, danger inducing pile of stuff. Experts say efforts to force hoarders to get rid of their piles of stuff usually fail, as other piles tend to come back within just a few months. Treatment options are limited. The more successful ones tend to try to convince a hoarder, much like an alcoholic, that he or she has a problem that must be addressed. One thing is clear while not every collector is a hoarder, 
Every hoarder collects so much stuff, it all confines them to a life lived alone and at risk. There are resources available if you or someone that you know needs some help. I'm talking local resources. You can find a link in this article at the next section on 9news.com. 9 Wants to Know continues to investigate the case of the man who was lost in his own home. If you haven't listened, I highly encourage you to check out the podcast, Blame Lost at Home. Episode 9 is now out. You can find it wherever you get your podcasts. An update on Colorado's favorite wanted man, the dude who commented on his own mugshot on Facebook. It does not end well for this genius criminal mind. The most Colorado thing we saw today is a brilliant brovention. And these guys gave it the perfect name, too. The forecast suggests I might not sweat through my shirt this weekend. I will leave you with that pleasant image. That's next. Del Norte police post bug shots of wanted people from time to time. And one wanted man slipped into the comments to express his disgust that he was being called out for his open drug warrant. Poor choice, dude. Suddenly, Tristan Brown became the most famous wanted man in Alamosa County when he logged on to offer the thoughtful observation, that's blanked up. You know what's not blanked up, Tristan? You being taken into custody last night. Got him at his girlfriend's place. So Tristan and that sweet stash of his are bunking down in the Alamosa County Jail tonight. The most Colorado thing we saw today is just a Jeemer. Not familiar with the term. It's a BMW with the doors taken off like a Jeep. A Beamer turned into a Jeemer. Tannis Rayburn spotted these guys this week at the McDonald's drive through in Louisville. She rolled down her window and told them that she liked their ride, and they said, yeah, it's our Jeemer. I like it. It's catchy, but I might have called it a beep. Congratulations, you made it through the week. It's Friday and there's relief from the heat on the way and maybe some beneficial rain. I think you're going to be surprised by the forecast for tomorrow. The front comes in in the wee hours of the morning after a day with highs back in the mid 90s. I know it was 10 degrees cooler for many areas, but still plenty toasty. Tonight we're tracking some severe storms east of Cheyenne out on the east central plains. Hail and wind producing storms that should stay confined to southeastern Colorado. Front comes in tomorrow. Temperatures in the 70s and yet Yes, maybe some rain from storms that develop late in the day. Tonight, there are high base storms again, wind and lightning, not much rain, tracking into Nebraska and Kansas. Mostly sunny to start, clouds by midday, and then those afternoon storms. But the big story, the headline is how about this Saturday high after a week of record high temperatures and maybe some moisture to help out with the extreme fire danger? And we've got 88 on Sunday, back to the 90s on Monday and Tuesday, and maybe, uh, well, I don't know, Mother Nature might have a little 4th of July. A spectacular plan on the 4th. Maybe a little lightning, Kyle. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. We have all seen parents in public who are clearly stressed to the limit. The story, though, is what happened next. You can change a life tomorrow. I'm telling you, all it takes is kindness. Like that which was shown to a young mother named Rebecca at a King Supers yesterday. She was stressed to the limit at the checkout by her kids, and that's when she realized she didn't have her wallet. Here. My name is Rebecca Barnett. Come here. I'm a young mom of two kids under the age of two. Lucy, come here and sit next to mommy. This week in particular come here. has been very difficult. Let's look what I have. I am home alone with both babies all day. We don't have AC and it's been record breakingly hot. I don't feel. Wagon. And can you share with your brother? We went to King Supers yesterday to get groceries for Theodore's welcome party. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. After I had gotten all the groceries scanned, I reached back for the wallet and the diaper bag, and it wasn't there. I would remembered that I left it on the desk at home. And on my way out, I called my mom, and I started having a breakdown. I pretty much told her that this was it. This was all my little window of tolerance could handle. And I just felt seriously defeated. <laughs> So I get the babies loaded back in the car. I'm getting ready to sit back down in the driver's seat and I hear a woman from behind me say, excuse me. And I turn around and she's standing there with a cart of groceries. And she said that she would be happy to pay for my groceries so that I didn't have to take my kids back home. 
Yeah? My faith was just absolutely fully restored. Here had come practically this angel woman giving me a break that I desperately so needed. And I was not able to get her name, but I just want her to know how much I truly and greatly appreciate her gesture because that little tiny thing seriously changed our lives yesterday. If you can help us connect Rebecca with that generous woman in the blue dress at King Supers, email me please, next at 9news.com. We meet so many amazing Coloradans here on Next, people whose passion just jumps through the screen at you and causes you to write in in droves to tell us what meeting them through the TV meant to you. And this week, no one more so than Bobby Thompson from Denver Election. She was taking last second voter questions through Denver 311, and she spoke from the heart about what her role in democracy means to her. It's a big honor for me. Now I'm gonna keep weeping, <laughs> yeah, uh, it is. It's a big honor that I get to help. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Why do you get emotional about it? Because I get to live in a country that cares, that cares, that gives us the opportunity to vote, and I get to facilitate them in any bitty small way. Friends, look who's here. It's Bobby from Denver Elections, and we are going to share your good news together next. It's Friday. It is time for your good news, as always. Our special guests will join me in a moment with some of yours right after we hear from your neighbors out at Confluence Park. My good news. My good news is I'm trying to think about some good news. I have good news that I am actually here teaching somebody to skate in their wheelchair, and she's an absolute rock star. My good news is that I, I am seeing my aunt, and they think that they can adopt me, and I really hope they can. My good news is it's a great day to go golfing and a great day to hang out with family and friends. My good news is um, getting to spend time with family. My good news is um, that I met a woman named Miss V, and she's a blessing to me, me and my mom's life. Well, my good news is I just booked a trip to uh, California with my girlfriend. That'll be my first uh, trip by myself, really, you know, coming of age. So uh, you know, I finally reached that age where I can actually travel and become an adult. <laughs> my good news is that I get to go to the mountains with my family, playing in the water. All right, what do you say, Bobby Townsend from Denver Elections? You want to read some good news? Sure. All right, go for it. All right, Paul Dykema, I'm 888 days sober today. Isn't that astonishing? <laughs> That's, That's so great. Corinna Ayala writes, I got a promising job interview today. I've been stressing about finding work to cover my tuition. Jenny, I'm turned 45 today, 45 years of learning, loving, and laughter, mostly laughter, but grateful for all of it. That's so cool. And Kelly Seaton says, my 12-year-old dog is on the upswing from being sick. We went for a real walk for the first time in a week. I tell you what, as somebody with an old dog in my life, I know how much that means. Thank you for being here. You brought Thank people you. joy this week. Brandon Ritterman has brought a lot of people joy and information over the years. We will miss him, but we will see you next time.